Hello everyone, my name is Ashla and it is a pleasure to welcome you to the Glass House Lecture Series. With over half a year of programming, we're greatly honored to have featured a powerful array of writers, artists, and thinkers who have each offered valuable insights on the fashion industry, its history, and its potential. From topics regarding Coco Chanel to Lee Bowery, systems of oppression to futures of freedom, each talk has been a fascinating point of connection with each other and our collective path in the field. By presenting many viewpoints through which we examine fashion and to embody the ways fashion is formed through shared relationships and spaces, the Glasshouse sees intersections of difference as a key to dialogue. Our hope is that these lectures will allow you to critically analyze your world, especially as it relates to product consumption, design, and trend, leading to many discussions that strengthen your connection with the medium and your community. Our ways of dressing are tools through which we have agency, both in our individual expression and in choosing where our clothes are sourced. In this lecture, we are excited to explore the subject of fashion sustainability and our connection to the earth. Today, we are happy to be joined by Heather Puddle, who will present her lecture, Redesigning Fashion from Soil to Soil, Building Ecosystem and Community Health Through Textiles. Heather Puddle manages partnerships and advocacy for Fibershed, a nonprofit organization based in Northern California that develops regionally based natural fiber textile systems to build ecosystem health and community resilience. Heather's current work at Fibershed is focused on collaborations with fashion and design schools in Northern California, state textile policy advocacy, and programs and partnerships at the Fibershed Learning Center in Point Reyes Station, California. Heather received her BS in biology from Maharishi International University and an MS in Agricultural Ecology from the University of California, Davis. She has more than two decades of experience with research, practice, promotion, and teaching in sustainable and organic agricultural systems, having worked with a wide range of nonprofit, philanthropic, philanthropic, and educational resources. As a natural dyer and textile artist herself, she integrates her background in ecological research and agricultural systems with community and land-centered perspectives on fashion and textile systems. In her work and research, Pottle centers land use and regulatory systems by uncovering mismanaged systems of waste and their effect on individual and community health. Introducing new revolutionary methods of textile manufacturing, which allow for natural fabrication and biodegradation, Pottle elucidates Fibershed's role in progressing us towards a more sustainable future. In her talk, we are reminded of the earth and its soil, the universal origin from which we all spring and eventually return to, and the way ecology, fashion, and our lives are in a constant and ever more important dialogue. This recognition is a method of honoring our planet's generative sustenance and creating regener regenerative possibilities for working with our environment to address the single most pressing issue of our time, the climate crisis. We're so happy to have you with us today to engage in this dialogue that's both deeply important to the glass house and our world at large. Today's lecture will be about 30 minutes, followed by a Q&A hosted by creative director of the Glass House, Dr. Brooke Graybick. If you would like to receive notifications about upcoming lectures or view pre previous ones, please visit welcometotheglasshouse.com and enter your email in our contact page. Heather, I will let you take it from here. Thank you, Ashla. Um, I'm, I'm grateful to be here to discuss some topics that um, are really dear to my heart and to share um, in the course of this really fascinating lecture series that you're uh, coordinating here, um, stories from my community in Northern California and a framework that we're using um, that we feel can be hopefully helpful um, to anyone listening for thinking about how their work fits into um, a larger picture of possibilities in the fashion system. So um, I'm going to kind of um, start off from one perspective of harms that are happening right now in the general way that we're seeing the fashion system manifest, um, but then I'll, I'll move to some more hopeful conversations. Um, so the, the overall title of my talk is Redesigning Fashion from Soil to Soil, Building Ecosystem and Community Health through textiles. And the reason um, that, that we're needing to talk and think about all of these topics today 
is that our current fashion system um, is really facing a number of crises. Um, we're, we're seeing the climate crisis become more and more predominant every day in our news cycle. Um, and it's, it's not something that everyone um, is always familiar with when we think about the connection between our, our clothes and the climate immediately. Uh, but I invite you to look down right now at what you're wearing and think about where uh, the shirt, the pants, um, the dress, the skirt, whatever you're wearing right now, what is it made out of and where did it come from? Do you even know? Um, very likely what you're wearing is actually made out of fossil fuels because at this point, almost 70% of the textiles that are produced globally are made from synthetic fiber whose source is either oil or fracked gas. That's the raw material that most of our clothes are now made out of. Um, and so our clothing is tightly connected with the climate crisis. Our clothing is also tightly connected with another um, environmental issue that has come into the news quite a bit on microplastic pollution. You've probably seen how abundant uh, the findings of microplastics are in the ocean, in surface waters. Increasingly, we're finding it uh, just in the air we're breathing. It's being uh, found more and more inside of the bodies of other organisms and inside of human bodies. So microplastics get a lot of attention often as the idea of something that's breaking down from a larger piece of plastic. And in truth, um, on, the, on the left side of this slide, you know, there's a number of different sources of plastic that are very predominant right now in our environments that are breaking down into microplastics. But synthetic textiles is one that often falls off the radar of what people think about as a source of microplastics, when in fact, it's one of the most important sources um, because fibers are predominant in the types of microplastic particles that are being found across all of the, the different waters and air and soil samples that, um, that researchers are increasingly studying. And so we have to start thinking about our clothes when they are made out of synthetic fibers, out of plastic as a form of macroplastic that we're wearing around and as a form of, um, of, of a microplastic uh, source that's really important for us to address. Uh, a third sort of crisis that I want to highlight in the current model of our fashion and textile system is the externalizing of costs onto, onto workers and vulnerable communities. Um, so in the United States, um, you know, I think there's often an assumption that workers have strong protections, that minimum wage laws are strong. And unfortunately, the case has been that wage theft in the, the garment industry is very strong, which means that workers are not actually paid what they should be paid according to minimum wage. California addressed this with a piece of legislation passed two years ago. Um, there's another piece of legislation now in the federal um, Congress that could address this at a federal level. But the, the real pressure that we're seeing is the, the model of clothing production right now pushes the costs of our clothes, which are which are going down quickly. Um, the costs are, instead of being borne by consumers, they're being borne by the people all along the supply chain and the people at the end of life. Um, so uh, the people who are seeing uh, the waste products at the end of the consumption of our textiles. And this, this image of several things put together onto one graph um, tells a very strong story about what has been happening over the last several decades in the utilization, the production and the utilization of fibers and textiles in our global systems. Um, if you see the green section at the bottom, this is the, this is the line that shows natural fiber uh, production globally from 1970 um, through current and projecting forward. You can see that line doesn't change much. There's there's actually not much variation. We're, we're limited by the biological capacity of our planet. And that's where, um, that's where we see the capacity being held. Um, 
The purple section is synthetic fiber production. And you can see that we're not held by a natural limit there. And similar to what we're seeing with the, the repercussions of oil extraction being used in the energy sector, oil extraction going into plastics and going into plastic clothes is having repercussions um, like we've just talked about with waste and microplastics um, and, and the impact on everyone along the supply chain when volumes are increasing to this degree. The red line that you see um, precipitously going up is the line of clothing sales globally. Um, whereas ironically, um, the blue line that crosses it going down is clothing utilization. So how long we're actually using clothes. And you see these, these consumer behavior trends um, are really tightly connected with the material trends, the, the trends of how these materials are moving into and through our textile systems. There's really an inflection point um, that we can see around the year 2000 when this model of fast fashion um, started becoming predominant. And that's really where the, um, the model of high volume production took off around the world with fast fashion brands, but it also um, is connected with these shifts in consumer behavior, purchasing and use behavior, with the result that um, this, this sort of purple mountain of synthetics textile use is really growing and it's becoming um, a, a problem. Um, so in summary, this, this current model that we're looking at is one um, that many people describe as take, make, and waste. Um, it's a linear model. It's one where we're sourcing uh, our materials um, largely from oil and gas deposits. We're making clothing at, at a rate that isn't healthy for the people working at any point along that supply chain. And we're producing waste um, that's, that's not healthful, it's harmful, um, and it's particularly impacting the most vulnerable communities. Um, even when we donate our clothes, you might've heard some of these statistics, only about 10% of what is brought to thrift stores domestically is actually put onto the racks of those stores. The rest of that goes into some form of um, overseas generally shipping. We don't have much infrastructure right now in the US. There's very little that's actually being handled and reused or, or recycled here. The majority of that is going into communities like um, like Accra, Ghana, where this photo on the right was taken. Um, and even the secondhand market industry is just completely overwhelmed. Um, so that's something that points to the inherent um, unhealthfulness of this model. Nowhere along the system is ecosystem health, human health, or community health either valued or inherently supported in the way that the economy works. So what I wanna talk about today is a model that we're developing here in Northern California through the organization I work with, Fibershed, um, and the, the very large community of fiber producers, artisans, manufacturers, processors, designers, and consumers who wanna be part of creating a different model. And the model that that we're adopting here, we're framing out and starting to try to fill in is a soil to soil model. It's a circular model, but um, there's something inherently um, grounded about understanding that circularity has to be connected with natural cycles. Circularity isn't something that can just exist outside of, of natural cycles. And so when we're talking about circularity, we're thinking about soil to soil. Um, and just a little bit of background about this organization and this concept of fiber shed that, that has incubated um, the work that I'm going to talk about in this framework. Fiber shed is an organization. It's, it's um, originated here in Northern California, but the concept is something um, broader. It's a, it's a term sort of like watershed or food shed that a lot of people are starting to think about with our food systems. In this case, we're applying that lens to our fiber system of understanding what is the strategic geography, the, the, um, the particular landscape that we're in 
that can help to sustain basic needs that we have, and in this case for, for clothing and for textiles. Um, how can we understand within our community and within our landscape where those can come from? And while a lot of the examples that I have to share with you are from Northern California and the community that I work with here, there are 75 affiliate communities um, that are coordinating themselves within this global fiber shed movement who are similarly looking within the lens of their regions um, on how these same processes could happen. So within the soil to soil model, um, I will start with talking about the soil. And in the soil, we have this incredible potential. We have um, often the opportunity to look at either a lens of crisis or potential in our world today. Um, so when we look at just the, the concept of soil as a basis for our agricultural production, whether it's for food or for fiber, we can understand this as um, something that is in great need of remediation um, because this, our agricultural soils have been extremely depleted of carbon. Um, actually, the the loss of carbon from our soils is one of the important sources of carbon into the atmosphere in addition to industrial emissions. Um, however, the potential of our soils to take back carbon um, from the atmosphere um, to build the level of organic matter in our soil, which is what holds fertility, it holds water, it holds all of the, the health and strength of soil that allows it to produce healthy healthy crops and healthy um, plants and healthy animals living off of those plants, um, that carbon content of the soil is tightly connected with that soil's ability to function in an ecologically healthy way and to, to produce viable crops. So by focusing on the soil in our agricultural systems where we're producing cotton or wool or other fibers, um, which is what the, the crops that, that we tend to think about um, at Fibershed, there's incredible potential to utilize certain practices uh, that will increase the drawdown of carbon through the through the growing of healthy plants. Those plants increase um, the the uh, secretions that they put into the ground from sugars they're making out of carbon in the atmosphere, which is um, what plants are amazingly designed to do. So these are natural systems that are designed to do this, to sequester carbon. And by working with them um, within, within the agricultural systems that we have, um, we can create incredible biodiversity and ecosystem function, as well as creating that kind of um, carbon drawdown. So moving through the soil to soil circle to the next um, the next sort of phase in that circle, um, we talk about the fiber, dye, um, and food plants that are often integrated into that system. So in our case, um, again, we're focusing mostly here in Northern California on cotton and wool systems, um, but we also uh, look at the natural dyes that are possible to get from the earth to replace uh, the synthetic dyes that are predominant um, you know, in the majority of the clothes we're wearing now. So what are the ways we can bring health into those systems? And with natural fibers, uh, there's an incredible opportunity for engaging with the land because they do come from the land. So stewarding our regional environment can become closely tied to the source of our textiles. Uh, there's also just incredible cultural significance to natural fibers. There's incredible histories and um, practices that that create um, the culture that we have. So natural fibers have this, this history that we can draw on in every, every region that we could be living in around the world has held sophisticated knowledge of tending land for ecosystem health and textile material culture. Um, on the right side of the screen here, you'll see some uh, volunteers working with a teacher uh, local to my land here named Redward, Redbird Willie. He's a, a descendant of the Pomo people that were native to the land just north of where I live. And they are tending a field of a plant called dogbane or Indian hemp, sometimes referred to. It's a bast fiber. It produces a fiber in the stem 
um, that was incredibly important uh, for thousands of years in this region for making twine. And the models that we have of how this crop was tended, because this is an indigenous crop to our area, have a lot to teach us, um, just as in any region, we can look to some of those um, knowledge ways. The next sort of rung on our, on our cycle of going around the soil to soil model is processing. Once you have the natural fibers, what kind of processing um, can be done with them? And at Fibershed, we've done a lot of research in our region on what the infrastructure is that exists right now for both producing and processing natural fiber textiles. So on the right-hand side of this slide, you'll see um, a graphic representation of a study that was done in collaboration with the University of California Davis on the quality, the quantity, and the distribution of wool production across California. Uh, looking at this study, it became clear that we have a very high quantity of fine quality wool in California that could be used to make garments, to go all the way to fine finished garments, but we unfortunately have very little infrastructure for processing those textiles. Uh, a, a similar or a line study that, um, that we supported in 2020 uh, was an assessment of capabilities of Western United States fiber manufacturing. And you can see here a summary of some of this uh, research into what, what aspects of the fiber processing from harvest through the cleaning and the um, spinning, knitting, weaving, manufacturing up until having finished garments, which of these we have present in the Western US and which of them are missing. Um, and you can see from this graph that we have quite a bit missing. Um, there, there are a lot of pieces here. We have quite a bit of production of wool and cotton, um, but there's very little processing capacity for them. So just understanding this within one's own region, understanding where the opportunities might be if you have products um, that could be added value to in your region. Um, this is a way to get started on the road to understanding what it might take to build those industries back up. Um, so that's something that we're very focused on. The next rung of this cycle in, in this um, soil to soil cycle involves designers and makers. So who are the who are the individuals, the people that can step between fiber production systems, whether that's coming um, directly from the land around you or whether you're sourcing it from fiber producers, uh, processors, how can anyone at that intersection point who is a designer in some capacity um, serve as a connector to the types of products that can become available in our communities when that link is made to back to our landscapes, back to our communities of having a viable economy um, that's connected to ecosystem health. So um, I have a couple of examples from, from my community of designers who are working in their industries with that lens of how can I connect a healthy system for fiber production and processing to goods that can be made available in my community? On the left side of this slide, you can see um, a, a small scale brand that's based um, here in California called Grange Home. They make beautiful home goods uh, sourced, uh, many of them locally. And here's a picture of the, of the designer and founder um, taking her products back to the field where they actually were sourced. Much of that wool um, came from this particular uh, farm that she's um, pictured at here. And on the right, um, there's an incredible company we've been working with called Seed to Shirt that um, takes this soil to soil framework very seriously. They're um, and and came up with with this as their inherent business plan before before we met them. Um, Tamika Peoples on the right is the founder of that company. She's working specifically to empower Black cotton farmers, um, both in Africa where she's uh, worked traditionally in the past and now in the United States as well, where she's deepening a lot of work with cotton farmers in the Southeast United States. Um, 
She's also connected here in California and has been here for a while. She's building an entire supply chain going back to the farm and empowering and creating opportunities for Black farmers and business owners all the way across that supply network. Um, so her work is just incredible. And it comes from that place of design, um, design as a connector and design as a way to change the inherent structure of that system. So the next rung on, on the cycle would be the garments that are produced. Um, and, you know, I, I wanted to show you some examples of companies uh, that we've been working with through Fibershed to develop products that are traceable back to farms and ranches participating in a climate beneficial verification program that Fibershed developed uh, initially here in our Northern California region to support the farmers and ranchers we're working with here. This uh, program is expanding now to other regions around the country. And these are some brands um, who have products now available on the marketplace that are absolutely traceable back to the farms and ranches um, where these practices are being um, implemented. The, the, the carbon farming practices that, that I mentioned earlier are being implemented, they're being tracked and verified. So um, the, the impact of the choices that the designers and brands are making is carried through and is able to be communicated all the way from the impact on those production systems through the, the um, domestic supply chains that they're using and all the way into these garments um, that are now more and more available on the market. And I wanted to mention that um, in addition to clothing, uh, a lot of the businesses that we're working with are also making other textile goods. And, and that's an important piece of the whole picture of what can come from our landscapes, because some wool um, is fine quality wool that's wonderful for next to skin. Some wool is coarser wool that's incredible for bedding and other upholstery projects um, or products. It's, it's an incredible um, evolution of nature over tens of thousands of years um, to develop the qualities that these natural fibers have. And so all, all different types of uses um, have matches to the types of different varieties, whether it's in cotton or wool. The, the diversity of wool breeds and cotton varieties is also an important part of understanding what's possible when we connect more deeply with our landscapes um, so that we have relationships with those, not just the producers, but the plants and the animals themselves. On the topic of garments, I also wanted to bring up the critical role that our use and care plays in how our, our textiles and our garments impact um, our ecosystems. So um, there's a wonderful research group based in Norway called CIFO. They do a lot of really rigorous research on um, clothing use patterns and um, production systems um, around the world. And so some of their research has is, is really been informing an understanding of how important this phase of use is in and how impactful um, our choices about how long we wear our clothes, how long we use our clothes, um, what types of care and laundering practices and whether we can keep our clothes in circulation longer because uh, we have these practices of taking care of them, of mending them as these, these photos are um, of some mending uh, workshops that we've hosted here locally. And then the final step in this, um, in this cycle around the soil to soil framework um, in our model is compost. And I think um, sometimes people might have a question about when would composting ever be appropriate for textiles in the modern world, first of all, because um, if you've looked down at your clothes at the start of this lecture, you probably started thinking about what's in your clothes, maybe besides uh, just the fibers. There's a lot of dyes and fiber treatments that go on to the textiles that we have in our closets and our homes. Um, and so it's, I, I wanna just first acknowledge that um, 
we can't compost synthetic fibers. They don't break down in compost piles, but natural fibers do. Um, however, natural fibers can be treated with things that will keep them from being necessarily healthy to cycle back into our, our ecosystems, especially some of the waterproofing chemicals that are used um, or stain resistant chemicals um, known as PFAS. Those are getting a lot more attention in policy and regulation conversations, but they're, they're very present in a lot of the textiles we have. So we have to kind of step back, I think, and talk about the fact that we do have a lot of clothes that we can't cycle back into nature and, and that's a problem. So what would it look like to have a system where our clothes were so healthy um, for us and for our ecosystems that we could cycle them back into nature? Um, so some of the steps that we're taking in our region to start to understand that possibility and what those, those um, pathways might look like are textile composting pilot projects. And there's a picture on the left of um, the Fiber Shed Learning Center where I work and some textile composting pilots that we've been running there for the last couple of years. Um, we're, we're using in that case offcuts from a brand partner we have that's located here in the Bay Area called Harvest and Mill. They, they are giving us untreated organic cotton um, factory offcuts that we're putting into these compost piles. So we know that there's nothing unhealthy on these textiles. We can put them into the, into the piles that we're cycling back into the garden that you see pictured on the other side of the screen. Um, these pilot projects have been really important um, just to start bringing people to sites where this is happening and give them a real uh, visual and tangible experience that healthy textiles can go back into our ecosystems. Um, and as I said, earlier, they're actually going into our ecosystems all the time. Our textiles are, um, it's not just at the end of life because of the nature of the, um, the fabric structure of the textiles we wear, they're, they're releasing microplastics or microfibers, whatever um, they're made out of. If they're, if they're made out of synthetic fibers, they're releasing microplastics. If they're made out of natural fibers, they're releasing natural microfibers um, all the time. And so I think one of the reasons it's important to consider the compostability of our textiles isn't just because we want to close this loop, although we do, it's because it, it helps us think more clearly about what's in what we're wearing and how can those choices that are made all along uh, the stages of production feed back into a product that is so healthy that after a long lifespan of use, hopefully with uh, many cycles of of, of trading and mending and really maximizing the use of precious clothing um, at the end of its life, it could eventually go back into our ecosystems. So the next steps that we see in that pathway to closing this cycle, um, besides some of the textile compost pilots that are happening, um, I know in California, there's also some really exciting research happening in Australia. And I have a photo there of some um, research that Cotton Australia has done with um, cotton mulches um, as well as cotton um, composted cotton going back into cotton fields actually and they're they're studying the beneficial impacts of that as a soil amendment to highlight again that this is possible and we just need we need both um, standards development through research on what textile treatments would be healthy to compost. Um, and then we also need policy change. Once we've established um, a set of standards, and this is happening right now in Australia, they're the first country to develop um, or to be developing, they're currently developing a set of uh, textile compost standards um, that will be available in a couple of years because it's a long process for them to put that whole set of standards together. Once those are in place, policy change can then start to incentivize and catalyze um, more ability to identify textiles that can be composted and, um, and start to certify that. So this is just to say it's a lens into what that whole cycle would look like um, when we're really designing and understanding our places, um, the, you know, the roles that we can each play depending on where 
we might be acting within this cycle, um, how can we help connect each of these places? So this is um, a framework that could hold some of these conversations. Um, it's not that this exists at an industrial scale right now. It does exist at pilot scales, um, which is exciting right there. And the fact that there are communities around the world trying to implement um, pilot projects to, to uh, ground truth and create um, a viable proof of concept for how in our modern world, we could start to have true circularity grounded in nature, in natural cycles, um, it it offers some hope for a, a system of textile production um, that is actually healthy for, for ourselves and for the planet. Um, so um, I'm really excited to have the opportunity to share this work and I'm glad to answer more questions. Heather, thank you so much for that wonderful presentation, uh, deeply disturbing, but also deeply inspiring. And uh, the work that you're doing is so important to address the most pressing issue of our time. And it's absolutely imperative to have this as the basis of our conversations on fashion. So thank you so much. Um, my name is Brooke Graybeck. I'm the creative director of The Glass House. So I'll jump right into questions. Um, first, let's talk about, um, you know, in the many dialogues of fashion in our time, there are really necessary and positive changes taking place. So let's take, for example, um, body positivity or ageism. Um, on the one hand, it's imperative that there's not, you know, one standard of beauty or an acceptance of only a single body type uh, that's visible as fashionable. But on the other hand, these issues are complicated because they seem to put the onerous on women, particularly just to be comfortable with ourselves in spite of a culture that continues to most highly prize you know, thin bodies, for example, or youth. So the failure to do this is then painted as personal when we live in a society that kind of institutionally doesn't support these changes. So I wanted to ask you about this in terms of the framework of sustainability and fashion. What is the dialogue that you see here between places that we need to have personal agency? And then to what extent are these larger structural and institutional issues? Thanks for that question, Brooke. Um, uh, I think that parallel that you're drawing is so is so important and appropriate, um, you know, to say that there's ways that um, people are made to feel guilty for not being able to meet a standard of behavior or of um, uh, accomplishment in, you know, in some aspect with, with fashion um, when it's really not within their scope of agency. So I, I think, um, you know, one of the criticisms that the sustainable fashion movement often has to has to hear and internalize and respond to is um, like a price inaccessibility, number one, for products that are made in a way that, um, you know, don't harm the earth and are respectful of people and pay living wage. Those products end up being extremely expensive compared to ones that are externalizing costs, um, but carry a, a lower price tag. So there's an inequity in accessibility there inherently. And I think it's it's incredibly important to to hold that that acknowledgement that um, the system itself, just like you were saying, the system itself, just like it it pushes, um, you know, those personal behaviors um, into a certain uh, lane, just because of of the, the agency or lack of agency that we have. That's the same here. Um, people don't widely have access to products um, that do cost more that are coming from some of these systems. So I think, um, you know, one of the ways that that we're trying to internalize and address that um, in my just community broadly here, of whether it's Fibershed or within 
um, the kind of array of, of people working in this field is that, um, you know, what are the really easy access points for one thing? Because I think it is important to give everyone access to this field. And um, so mending workshops um, in a way has an accessibility. It, that also requires um, time and it, it requires sometimes transportation. So all the different things that might seem accessible, you know, we're having to look at what are the accessibility? How can we bring outreach and opportunities to engage um, to people where they are? Um, how can we create more scholarships for workshops that are skill-based? Um, how can we create ex uh, clothing swaps and clothing exchanges that bring accessibility? I, I think one of the really important ways that we're going to sort of um, combine accessibility with high quality products in the future is that we will, and, and this is a direction that um, policy is going to, we will have much more robust repair and reuse programs regionally. Um, and and that's that's also built on having products that are high quality and that you know want to be used many times can be used. And so often these natural fiber products um, are just much longer lasting. They are they're more of an investment piece. So I think those fit together. Um, but creating access at at every point is really essential and creating system change and creating policy change that incentivizes people to do the in businesses to do the right thing um, is bottom line, one of the most important things that we can be doing. Okay, well that uh, segues right into our next question, which is really about um, what are the changes and we can go through these one at a time, both on a personal level as, consumers, I hate to define ourselves like that, but as consumers, we can make, then let's talk about the changes that we could make for uh, small fashion operations or big fashion operations. You know, the work that you're doing with Fiber Shed is so incredible. So I'm sure a lot of the questions are going to be like, how do we get involved? How, you know, how would a brand start to work in this circular way? So on the business level, and then let's talk about kind of the policy changes that you could see implemented that would create the biggest impact in the field. So why don't we start with what can we do on a personal level in a day-to-day -day way that has positive effects? You talked about mending. What are the other ways? Yeah. So on a personal level, I think any way that we can just have a stronger relationship with our with our clothes uh, and the textiles in our homes, um, you know, that's that's something that can build both like joy and community and connection in just in your life. Um, and that might look like, it might look like learning how to mend. It might look like having a clothing swap with your friends. It might look like really thinking more, um, more comprehensively about what clothes you have and what you need and kind of reassessing your own use patterns of your clothes so that when you go to buy things, you're really buying things that you're going to wear many times and, and hold a lot of value in. Um, so I think there's a lot we can do just to reconnect ourselves to our clothes as something that really have value. You know, I, I think a lot of people, um, when they sit down and think about the fact that, you know, everything we're wearing usually was, you know, passed through so many hands. You think about the person that sat and sewed the pair of pants you're wearing. Like there's an incredible amount of work that went into, no matter what it is we're wearing, uh, there was certainly a lot of work that went into it. And just giving ourselves the opportunity to take some time and, and really value and hold value for that can start to change right away. The, the, the types of choices that we might see for ourselves in the, in the clothes that we own and that we're going to buy. And I love that. I love that also because it shows that agency is not just about purchasing power, which we're often taught, but also about our own intimate relationship with our clothes and how we value them. So let's, um, let's then uh, move this question kind of one step 
further to maybe small businesses or even large fashion operations, how would someone begin to get involved in a circular system of production and what resources are out there um, for designers? Um, that's a that's a great question too. And I, I think wherever you are, that's what's so beautiful about a circle, you know, wherever you are on that cycle of the soil to soil framework, there's ways to be more connected to those points that are near you and to start connecting to points that are farther. But really the place that you probably would always start is just by looking at, you know, what are my closest points of connection? So if you are someone who's sourcing textile materials from, um, from another business, then you know the first steps might be to just start to ask more questions of your suppliers and try to learn more about what it is that's going into the products you're getting because there generally isn't a lot of transparency immediately offered. Um, we really have to start asking for it. So just starting to learn more about where your products are coming from and and thinking about where they're going. You know when you when um, when a when a brand makes clothes, um, there's some real, um, again, there's that value and there's that pride in what you're putting out in the world. And so starting to think from that lens of how could this last longer for someone? How could this hold more value? How could this product go out into the world in a way that makes it um, easier to stay in use and to hold value longer? Some of just those changes in frame can do something for you. Um, and then you know, more broadly, if if you're wanting to understand, are there sourcing options available to me that might have traceability back to, um, you know, ideally back to land, but, you know, how far back is possible? Um, in here in California, Fibershed has started a few different projects that are available um, at a, a larger scale to brands. So we have, um, there's a climate beneficial uh, fiber pool for wool that is a, a sourcing option for anyone wanting to purchase yarns um, that can then be woven or knit into fabric. Um, so having yarn on inventory is kind of a new thing in our region, just even having that available. So that exists um, in our region. Um, and then on the cotton side of our work, uh, there is a project called the California Cotton Climate Coalition that was started three years ago and is just starting to bring products to market. Um, so there's one of the partners um, in, in that project that is a, a knitting and a fabric produ producer in Los Angeles. So they're going to be starting to have fabric available that is traceable back to the partner farms in California that we're working with. Um, and that's not to say those are the only sources, um, but there's not a lot of easy sources. So finding, just starting to explore relationships with anyone who is is able to source back to farm um, can, can really go a long way in building your understanding of what it would take. Great. Thank you. And what about on the larger level of policy? What are the policies that you and Fibershed kind of see as the most important changes that could be implemented in the field? And then maybe uh, if it's possible, then we could also tie this into a conversation about like, how do we have standards in fashion for sustainability? Like what, what does that mean at this point? Right. Yeah. So I think this is a really exciting time because there is a lot happening right now, um, globally, especially with, uh, with policy change and policy, some new policy development in the textile industry. Europe is doing a lot in particular, that's pushing the whole global industry to think more about um, sustainability standards. Um, it's shifting the landscape a little bit um, in uncertain ways too, because it's not it's not quite clear yet exactly how all of those new pieces of legislation are going to land. I, I think it's important to hold, um, you know, that the whole picture of what needs to shift in order to allow the space for some of these um, more regionally based and grounded 
solutions to come up. And what that means is we we have to address these bigger pieces of the the over abundance of plastic in our textile systems. You know, the the just the amount of fossil fuels feeding into the industry needs to be addressed. And the exploitation of people across the whole supply chain needs to be addressed. And so some of the legislation um, that I mentioned in, in that did pass in California and now is being um, brought up at a national scale is really exciting and important. That's called the Fabric Act um, that was introduced. Um, it was just reintroduced last week um, in the, the US Congress. So that's a really important piece of just holding a protection for those garment workers, because if we don't hold that protection, um, the system will never be able to um, make a shift from where it's at. And globally, there are several organizations working on labor issues like um, Remake is a really great organization based here in California that's doing important work globally because we can't just address this in one place. Um, as you know, this is it's a global industry. And so this, these standards have to be upheld in many places, even though often we have to start where we are. So those labor laws are really important. Some of the, the fossil fuel standards and um, work towards that feels like a bigger and more complex piece, but, um, but I think it has to be folded into the conversation. And then, you know, there's a lot of ways to get at that. So some microplastics policy in general that can start to get at disincentivizing products that are producing microplastics and having those impacts in the environment. Um, another really important policy tool that is um, has been talked about for many years, but now it's getting um, implemented in some places in Europe and it's, it's um, now being considered in California and in New York um, is a, uh, a protocol called extended producer responsibility. It's a type of law that holds the producers of products responsible for the um, particular, the end of life management of those products. So this is something that we see in California already in mattresses. Um, there's a, there's a, a form of this where people have to pay a fee when they buy a mattress that helps pay for mattress recycling. Similarly with carpets, we have a program for that for batteries um, for pharmaceutical sharps. There's, there's ways that an industry can internalize the costs of waste management, and that's starting to really come forward in textiles. Um, so if that's well-designed and if we can really hold companies accountable in the right ways, these, these extended producer responsibility laws, these EPR laws could shift dramatically um, the kinds of incentives that companies have for material choice and also product design and longevity. Um, so I think those are the kinds of laws that we're really hoping will start to get at some of the systemic shifts that will open up access to more people to products that that are designed and, and made more healthfully. That seems so important because often I think about, you know, even how does the designer, the young designer know, you know, which fabrics to use and you know, I'm glad that you brought up microplastics because something that I've noticed is a lot of young fashion brands that are conceptually progressive um, and in some cases promoted as sustainable use synthetic materials for the majority of their clothing. And, you know, I think maybe part of this is kind of the massive resurgence over the last five years of styles from the 90s and early aughts. And as you mentioned, that was the rise of fast fashion and a lot of synthetic styles, you know, Delia's boot cut pants, um, all of this, these aesthetics were soaring fat pants. So the question here um, is, how do the fashion world and the environmental movement communicate? And you know, what could this relationship look like so young designers that really want to be on the right page with fashion uh, know the implications of the materials they're using? This has been really confusing for consumers and for, for brands, I think. Um, there's been such effective marketing of recycled polyester as a, as a really 
um, beneficial and sustainable material. I mean, and that's continuing um, to be marketed that way. Um, the, the just inherent disconnect between plastic clothing and natural cycles is is really, I think, an important place where this looking forward to what are looking ahead at what are these major crises that we're facing. Um, you know, the climate crisis um, just starts to highlight all of these ways that nature is not going to accept our um, going over its limits. Um, it doesn't really matter if we think it's okay. It's it's going to come back and tell us it's we actually have to live within the limits of nature. And so natural fibers just inherently, it's not to say that every natural fiber product, the way it's made now is inherently healthy, but natural fibers have the capacity to be grown in a way that's healthy. Um, whereas synthetics just don't, um, they don't have a, a production process that's, you know, you look back at, at how plastic and oil are extracted and processed, and there's just, there's nothing inherently healthy about that. And um, and the microplastics issue is confusing as well, I think, because there's, you know, important research being done on the release of microplastics through water, um, wastewater in washing machines. But while that is important to look at, it just looking at that ignores the fact that stormwater research is finding and has found here in the Bay Area, there's a larger throughput in stormwater than there is in wastewater, which means that the microplastics aren't just coming out of our laundry, they're coming out of our clothes and our textiles all the time. They're coming out of products that we use. Um, and we need to address the materials themselves at some point. We can't just keep having these materials circulating. So, you know, how, how to sort of unite style and and fashion and beauty kind of excitement and standards with that groundedness and what natural limits really are. I think those there is so much um, creativity to be brought forward sometimes when limits do come in. And so I think it starts with just trying to understand collectively what what are the limits we're looking at and and if we're seeing these microplastics showing up so strongly in, our environment and our ecosystems, we really have to be honest with ourselves about there's there's ways to design clothes um, that don't have that particular issue. And there's ways to be innovative in fabric design and, and um, even with fiber blending uh, with natural fibers, um, there's a lot of innovation that could happen if we took some of the weight and the investment out of synthetics and put it into natural fibers. It would also allow us to do more, I think, collective development as a community if there was more collective understanding and agreement. Um, one of the things that we've been doing this year at Fibershed, we've we've been running um, a design challenge for small and, and mid-scale designers in Northern California, trying to just help connect people with resources and information about um, what what soil to skin options are out there right now for designers. So we actually have a lot of information on our website about that right now through that design challenge, but we've been trying to pull small designers interests in some of these fabrics so that we could make larger orders um, and achieve some minimum orders that wouldn't otherwise be possible for smaller designers. And I think that sort of collaboration is one of the ways that this can happen. And I love that. And as we, begin to wrap up our Q&A that, you know, I, I wanted to ask you about an interest of mine, particularly in fashion. And, you know, one of the aspects of fashion that's so inspiring to me is this idea of constant change, because fashion shows us that, um, you know, it's not just about changing our clothes, but about the idea that we're mutable and have the ability for growth and, neuroplasticity for changing towards the better and mm -hmm. fashion reminds me of all of those things because it embodies that um, and even for addressing climate change that we have the potential to change so 
can you frame, which I think you've started to do so beautifully, um, sustainability in fashion for us so we can understand how it might actually really promote this change rather than dampen it? Yeah, well, that's a great question. Um, you know, you're, I think you're talking about this when we talk about neuroplasticity in humans, um, it opens up this way of thinking about what's possible. I think it, it sort of creates channels for hope too in places where we start to feel like um, our options are, are limiting and limiting. And so, you know, I also think about um, just the plasticity of nature and the way that um, we have access to so many types of fibers, so many types of dyes, this incredible richness that exists in nature because nature is inherently so creative and innovative. Um, you know, you walk through a garden and you can see like, there's no one more fashionable <laughs> in the world <laughs> than this garden. I mean, I've often had that thought. I didn't um, agree more. Yeah. And so I think when we bring a lens of trying to connect ourselves back to the cycles of nature and just put ourselves in a context where we're acknowledging we're held inside of that context. Um, you know, we're not outside of that context. It it gives us, it gives us kind of a a rightful sense of humility, but also I think it gives us permission to be really creative within those limits. Um, so I think sustainability within a context of connecting back to nature and acknowledging that human creativity and expansion is all possible because nature already holds all of that um, incredible creativity and possibility. That's um, that's sort of the frame that I would put on that. Well, that is, is so gorgeous. And I, I love your frame. So I want to ask you, working as our final question, um, working in your field uh, every day since your just hyper aware of the tragedy that's going on of our um, planet's crisis. Uh, what do you do on a personal level uh, to keep yourself happy, to keep yourself hopeful um, and to, uh, you know, engage in life in a way that feels good when there's structurally so much that needs to change? Wow, well, that's such an important question for all of us right now, isn't it? Um, yeah, I, I think because a lot of my work, like many of us focuses a lot on the computer and on thinking about systems and problems. Um, I find it really important to make sure I'm balancing that with something that's more tangible. I'm, I'm attracted to this field because I was a knitter. I am a knitter. Um, I'm a natural dyer. So making sure that I just have the chance to go out in, at Fibershed, we have a learning center with a beautiful demonstration garden. I hope people will come and visit us there. Um, I, I have the great honor of being able to process the indigo that we grow there. So it's like, I, I'm i trying to um, balance the more intellectual side of the tasks that I have with these, these grounded tasks. And then, you know, honestly, I think one of the most um, re kind of replenishing things that I do in my work is connect with people. And I'm so inspired by the work that I see other colleagues and other, um, you know, partners we're working with doing, whether it's here in our region or in other regions, that's really mainly the fuel that keeps me going when I start to feel worried. Um, I just feel like the, those connections to others who are doing inspiring work um, feeds my sense that, okay, we're in this together and here's, here's something I want to rise to, to meet and match. Well, thank you so much for doing that for us today and being such an inspiration. We so appreciate you being here and hope everyone has enjoyed the lecture today. Thank you, Heather. Thank you. Thanks, Brooke.